good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you would open your Bible to the book of Psalm, chapter 89. So, um, last week we looked at Psalm 88. And this morning we're going to be in the very next one, Psalm 89. Uh, the title of the sermon this morning is Jesus Secures Steadfast Love. And uh, I'll be reading the text as we go through it um, in the sermon. So I'm going to hold off reading it for now. I'll open us in a word of prayer. And then we'll jump right into the sermon this morning. So Psalm chapter 89, um, if you'll pray with me as we ask God to uh, please speak to us through this text this morning. Father, we are so delighted to, to have your word and to be able to read it and learn from it. And God, I ask now as we study this psalm, as we go through it and uh, meditate on it in this time that you would cause it to be life to us, God, that you would cause it to be our food and our drink, Lord, that by which we live. Um, God, cause it to be our source of joy and our, um, the reason that we sing, Lord, for, for the God that you are. And so now, God, we, we ask that you would come and do this, trusting that you will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine if a man came to you today and said to you, if you will give me all of your money, all of your possessions, all of your assets, everything that you have, I will make sure that you and your family are taken care of for the rest of their life. You will never have to worry about bills, ever. I'll take care of them. You'll never have to worry about a mortgage. You'll never have to worry about food. You'll never have to worry about your children's college education or cars or retirement, nothing. I will take care of all of it for the rest of your life. In fact, I'll make a promise to you. I'll even write a covenant written on paper for such and such terms. Would you do it? How could you be sure that the covenant would last? What if the man died before you did? Does that nullify the covenant? What if the man changed his mind? What could you do? What could you say? What if he turned out to be a phony? Turned out it wasn't a real covenant at all. How could you know that this covenant was true and trustworthy? A covenant, like any promise or any agreement, is only as good as the integrity and trustworthiness of the one who initiates the covenant. The question this morning is, how do we know that God will always love us? That God will always choose us. For those of us who are in Christ, how do we know that God will always love us and will always choose us? That God doesn't have an expiration date and will one day die. Or that God will in fact save us and not only save us, but always save us. Or that God won't change his mind. How do we know that God won't do to us what he did with Saul? And remove his love from us. How do we know that? Because God made a covenant with you and with me. And that covenant is not ultimately based on you or me, but on himself. It's a covenant of love not founded upon ultimately my commitment to it or your commitment to it, but God's commitment to it. And how do I know that I can trust this covenant? How do you know that you can trust this covenant? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus Christ. Because God took what was most precious to him and he sent him as a baby to this earth 2,000 years ago to live as a human being, to experience all the weakness and frailties of humanity, to experience the ridicule and the slander and oppression of humanity, to experience the torture and the suffering 
of humanity along with our death. We can trust the covenant that God made with us because of Jesus. The psalm this morning is in many ways a psalm about covenant. The word covenant in this psalm occurs four times, more than any other psalm. And the covenant that that the psalmist speaks of in Psalm 89 is, is essentially the covenant that God made with David. God made a covenant with David. God came to David and he said, look, David, I will never remove my love from you. Now that was important because David is going to do some horrible atrocities and yet God is going to still love him. David is, is, is going to commit adultery and, and murder and, and, and deception. And so hearing God say, I will never remove my love from you was important, especially considering that he had just removed his love from Saul. Which if you're wondering what does that mean and how does that work, you talk to me after. That's beyond the scope of this sermon. The question that I'm asking this morning is, are we recipients of this covenant? This covenant that God made with David. Was this covenant given only to David or was it also given to us? This morning we're going to see that we are not just recipients of this covenant. We are actually recipients of a better covenant. I think one of my favorite word or words in the book of Hebrews is the word better. It occurs 12 times in the book of Hebrews. If you read the book of Hebrews, you'll keep, you'll see the author making this argument of better, 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 better. And he makes this argument with covenant language. Hebrews 7, 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor, the secure of a better covenant. In Hebrews 8, 6, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent as the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since it's enacted on better promises. So yes, we are recipients of this covenant in Psalm 89, but we're not just recipients of this covenant. We are actually recipients of a better covenant that is signed in blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, the son of God. This morning, the main point that I want to make is this. Jesus secures. He guarantees steadfast love for his people. He guarantees it for those that are in Christ. Before we get to the text, we need to ask the question, who is the author of this psalm? Uh, You'll see it right here in Psalm 89, a maskeel of Ethan the Ezraite. Well, who is Ethan the Ezraite? Well, he is Haman's, or He-Man, whichever you prefer, brother. Haman is who we looked at last week, the author of Psalm 88. The sons of Zerah, Zimri, Ethan, and Haman. So what, the, the guy we looked at last week, Haman, this is his brother. He's also a wise man whose wisdom was only surpassed by Solomon in 1 Kings 4. For he was wiser than all other men. Solomon, wiser than Ethan. You know, it's like, wow, wiser than Ethan? He's wiser than Ethan and wiser than Haman. So... Here we have two brothers, two wise men, two psalms that sit side by side in the Psalter and how drastically different they are. People often think brothers are the same. They're not. They're different. Very different. Sometimes they're the same. Psalm 88 is the darkest and saddest and most hopeless psalm. It really is. You read Psalm 88 and it's like, there's no hope. There's no joy in it. Psalm 89, though, it has a hint of that gloom. Psalm 89, though, is a powerful song of the love and justice and righteousness and faithfulness of God. So let's look at this psalm this morning. It's quite a long psalm. That's why we didn't read it up front. I'm going to divide it into eight sections. And I hope you'll read along with me as I read through it. So Psalm 89, let's begin in verses 1 to 4. Eight sections we're going to look at. Verses 1 to 4, here's what Ethan writes. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. 
With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever in the heavens. You will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. What was glaringly missing in Psalm 88, Ethan writes in verse 1 of his psalm, the praise of God. He says, he begins, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord. We've looked at that word before, steadfast love. That's how ESV translates it. The Hebrew word is chesed. There's no good English translation of that word. The closest idea is maybe covenantal love, but there's really no good English equivalent of it. Uh, it's, it's essentially, it's a type of love that's not based on feeling. It's not based on circumstances. It is based on a covenant, a commitment. That's what this love is. And Ethan writes, I will sing about this love. I will sing of your chesed and make known your faithfulness. Faithfulness is a predominant theme in this psalm. It occurs eight times in this psalm, more than any other psalm. So covenant faithfulness occur in this psalm more than any other psalm and these are really two bedrock foundations of God that we delight and depend on the love of God and the faithfulness of God those are the two bedrocks in verse 3 we see Ethan's first use of the word covenant I have God says I have made a covenant with my chosen one here that covenant refers to david we know that because he says i have sworn to david my chosen one my servant and that word i want you i want you to maybe you might circle or highlight or just draw attention to that word chosen there the word that's used there for chosen it's also used of god's people as a whole in psalm 105 it's used of moses and psalm 106 it's also used of jesus and isaiah 42 prophetically referring to his servant the Greek word that's used here in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is the word eklektos. It's where we get the word elect from. And, and, and here's, here's what's, why that's important, because that word is also used of us. In the New Testament, that same word, eklektos, Colossians, put on then as God's chosen ones. That's us. In the sight of God, chosen and precious, 1 Peter 2. But you are a chosen race. So it's not just that David was God's chosen one. We are also, those who are in Christ, are God's chosen one. My point is that what secured, what guaranteed this covenant with David? Why David never had to worry about this? Was not David. David would commit adultery. David would commit murder. David would commit deception. David would commit military pride that would cost 70,000 people their lives. And yet God still loved him. God still was with him. Why? Because he was chosen. Because he was chosen by God. And so our covenant too, our covenant that God gives to us is not ultimately secured by us. Not ultimately. But by the fact that we are chosen in God. We are chosen in Jesus Christ. God created the covenant. He initiated the covenant. And he secures the covenant. How do I know that tomorrow I will be saved? Because... I am today because God will see to it. Verses 5 to 8. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to you, Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him? O Lord, God of hosts, who is as mighty as you are, O Lord? with your faithfulness all around you. 
Ethan poetically paints a picture of majesty, grandeur, and splendor in these verses. He gives us a picture of a God who is incomparable. He's greatly to be feared. He's awesome. He's above all. He's mighty. And when you read that, that, that kind of language, you might not uh, think well of that type of language because that for some might paint God in a bad light. Why? Because we tend to believe that absolute power corrupts absolutely, don't we? That quote, I was looking it up, it's taken from a, I don't know if it's really attributed to this man, but it's taken from a 19th century British politician named Lord Acton. In a letter, he wrote, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Is that true for God? God has absolute power. Does it corrupt him? Absolutely. And if not, why not? Why is that quote true except for God? Ethan includes a word that clues us in. He uses it twice in these verses. It's a word that we looked at earlier. It occurs eight times in the Psalms. Faithfulness. Look at it in 5b. Your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. And then again in verse 8. With your faithfulness all around you. God's power, God's might is never divorced from his faithfulness. The reason that the heavens praise the Lord, all the heavenly hosts stand in awe of this God and his might and his power is that God uses his power and his might, what? To be faithful to a faithless people. God takes his power and his might and he uses it to be faithful to people who don't deserve it. God is so faithful. He's so faithful to a faithless people that he would even have his son strip off his majesty and his splendor and wear a fleshly robe of humanity to show us and to show the world who is like him. Who is like our God? Brothers and sisters, money will not give their life for you. Not that it could. It's an inanimate object, but... Our job and our boss will not give their life for you. Our friends probably would not give their life for us. Probably. Maybe even our family, if put to the test, may not give their life for us. But Jesus did. Jesus did. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Because there was one who was so faithful to the point of giving his life for us. Verses 9 to 13. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it. In them, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand. High your right hand. Ethan continues with this theme of the power and majesty of God. God is king. God is owner. God is creator. Look at it here. He says that God is king. When your waves rise, you still them. I love how God talks to his creation. One of the reasons that Job is my favorite uh, uh, book in the Bible is the first two chapters and the last three or four chapters. Uh, because I love at the end how God talks about his creation. Like he speaks to his creation. He says in Job 38, Thus far you shall come and no farther. Hear your prave what proud waves be stayed. God speaks to the Pacific Ocean and says, You may come this far and no more. And it says, you crushed Rahab. This is not the woman at Jericho who helped the spies. That would be sad indeed if he crushed her. Rahab was known as an ancient sea monster. We have a, there's actually a picture of her. Uh, ac- That's actually the sea monster in Lord of the Rings. Um, but Rahab really was known as an ancient sea monster uh, in, in uh, mythological uh, writings. At times, just here, an extra point here. At times, Rahab refers to a woman. At times, it refers to Egypt. 
And at times it refers to this guy, all right? Uh, you you got to read in between the lines to understand this, okay? Uh, but what he's saying is, look, this sea monster that controls the, the waters, that's like what the, the myth believed, God crushed this sea monster. That's what Ethan is referring to here. God is owner. Verse 11, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in them, you have founded them. God is the owner of the earth. Why is that important? I think several of you know, um, or some of you know, that I like to watch several TV shows. Two of my favorite are Shark Tank or The Prophet. Uh, I think Nick is the only one who watches those besides me, maybe Blocker. But, uh, oh, and Kaylin, okay, thank you. All right, I'm not alone. Um, what I love about the shows is that, you know, you, you get to buy into this company. You can, like, make this deal. I'll give you $100,000, take 10% of your company or 25%. You know, uh, he, here's, here's the thing. Um, when we become Christians, we get grafted in as sons and daughters of the king. We don't get, like, 10%. We don't. God doesn't say, okay, give me your life. And I'll give you one little parchment of land, and, and, and that's what I have for you. No, God says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit, what? The earth. When you are a son of the king, you inherit the kingdom. All of it. You inherit the earth. We will enjoy all of it in eternity. God is the owner. He has a right to give it to whoever he pleases, and he chooses to give it to his sons and daughters. God is creator. Verse 12, when he says, the north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon. Uh, Tabor and Hermon are mountains. Here's a picture of them. These, these are actual real pictures of them. Uh, Mount Hermon is up in the north. It's up by the Sea of Galilee. It's a tall mountain. It's like 9,000 feet. Uh, Mount Tabor is down in the south by Nazareth. It's a small mountain. It's only like 1,900 feet. And I think uh, you can see like the, the giant difference here, you know. Uh, I think what he's trying to say is, look, like these mountains, this, this mag monstrosity of a mountain and this little hill, you know, that's good for maybe snow sledding or something. Uh, they both praise God. They, you know, it'd be like us saying like Mount Rainier, like declares the glory of God. When you look at this mountain, you just think like, wow, like it just, you just stand there in awe. And how much greater will it be when we stand in awe of the creator of the mountain? Creation is ruled by God. It is owned by God. And it is created by God. And in return, it joyously praises its king, its owner, and its creator. Verse 14 to 18. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exalt in your name all the day, and in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. In verse 14, we get a picture of the God that we serve. You know, so often kings and monarchs and dictators and presidents, you know, or whoever, use their power to serve their own needs. That's how it a lot of times goes. But our God, the foundation of his throne is righteousness, justice, love, faithfulness. You know, because of the internet, the, the corruption that exists in, in authority and government, uh, it's come into a light that was probably never known for centuries. I, it's not like corruption just like came on the scene. Uh, governments and, and dictators and presidents, they've always been corrupt. Always. We just didn't know about it. Uh, it, it just wasn't brought into the light. Because, but the internet has brought into the light at a level that we've never known before. It's the reason why in communist countries they squash the internet. Don't talk about the government. They don't want people knowing. It seems like every day we're hearing about some kind of corruption. Every, you know, every time you turn on the news today, there's a, a new cabinet member, 
a new senator, a new representative, a new judge, a new president, a new leader who's engaged in some form of corruption, uh, scandal, sexual immorality, embezzlement. Every day, it seems that way now. It's not just in America either. It's everywhere. It's every country. And this, what's my point of bringing this up? This digital awareness has burned many of us. It's burned us. And so for some of us, we have a mistrust of authority. A mistrust of anybody in a position of authority. To believe that all power is bad power. That those in a positions of authority only serve their own interest. And though there's probably a large amount of truth in that often in the world, Ethan wants us to know that there is no shred of truth in that when it comes to God. There is not one inkling of truth when it comes to our King, God. To be sure, God does serve his own interests. He does. But the difference is that his interests are always for our good. Always. Our benefit, what is right, righteousness is the foundation of his throne. God always does what is right, always. Uh, uh, God's interests are always for our justice. Justice is the foundation of his throne. God always does what is just. God always does what is loving. God always does what is faithful. Always. We never have to worry. You know, like, is God being righteous? Is God being just? Is God being fair? Is God being loving? Is God being... Yes, every time. Always. And the people who serve this God, Ethan says, they are blessed, verse 15. They are exalted, verse 16. They are favored, verse 17. They are protected, verse 18. This is the status of those who serve this God. Verse 19 to 27. Read along with me, if you will. Ethan says, Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him, so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Haman give, uh, um, excuse me, Ethan, sorry. Uh, Ethan gives a tangible example of what God does for those whom he chooses. And he uses David as his example. David is uh, the prototype, if you will. He says, verse 20, I have found, I have found David. Paul quotes this in Acts. In Acts 13, 22, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. God found David. David was not a king's son. He was not of royal lineage. He was not wealthy. He was not esteemed. There was nothing special about him. He was a shepherd boy. He was a young lad. Even his own father didn't think too highly of him. Samuel's got to ask, do you have any more sons? Oh, yeah, forgot, David. But God, like the shepherd who goes after the lost sheep, here goes after the lost shepherd and anoints him as king. And Ethan lists off everything that God does for David. And keep in mind that just as David, God chose David, and David receives all of these blessings, God too chooses us 
and we too receive all of these blessings. Look at them here. I'll, they'll be on the screen for you, but this is everything that God says David receives from him because he has chosen. He says that God will support him. He will sustain him. God will strengthen him. God will not allow his enemy to triumph over him. God will not allow the wicked to humiliate him. God will win his battles. God will extend love and faithfulness to him. God will make him victorious. God will make him a son. God will become personal to him. God will become the guarantee, the fortress that holds his salvation. God will make him preeminent, firstborn, highest of kings. These are the privileges and blessings that God bestows upon David. David and not just David all who are in Christ receive this maybe not exactly literally but all of this Jesus secures he guarantees these privileges for those who are chosen in Christ Verse 28 to 37, my favorite part of the psalm, the covenantal language. Read it with me. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. This is my favorite part of the psalm, the covenantal language. I want to highlight two aspects of this covenant and the covenant. I want you to see the absoluteness of these verses, the absoluteness of this covenant I mean, these verses kind of sound like a wedding vow in a sort. You know, you, you read wedding vows like, I will always be faithful to you. I will always love you. I will never forsake you. I will take care. You know, this is like, they, they have that kind of ring to them. God says, uh, forever, my steadfast love, I will keep for him forever. Stand firm. My covenant will stand firm forever. Again, I will establish his offspring forever. Verse 32, God says, I will. God will love him enough to discipline him. I will not. I will not remove my steadfast love from him. I will not. I will not be false to my faithfulness. I will not. I will not violate my covenant. I will not. I will not alter my word. Once for all I have sworn, I will not. I will not lie to David forever. His offspring shall endure forever. And then again, forever, his throne will be established forever. Notice the absolute nature of this covenant. God does not mix words here. There's no fine print to this covenant. There's no micro machines guy at the end speaking a thousand words a second. The, two, the guarantee of the covenant. What does God swear by? himself look at verse 35 once for all i have sworn by my holiness why is that important because that means that these promises this covenant that's given to david is ultimately not dependent on david ultimately but on god what secures this covenant is god now, don't misunderstand me. That's not to say that this is like an unconditional, universalistic type of covenant, you know, that David could just do whatever he wants and God would forever love him no matter what. No. There are always conditions. Always. But it is to say that because God is faithful, God will make sure that David remains faithful. In other words, 
God will not have to remove his steadfast love from David. Why? Because God will make sure that David always loves him. And then the psalm takes a dramatic shift. A dramatic shift. Verses 38 to 51 are like Psalm 88. I guess you know, Ethan and Haman were not all that different. Brothers are still brothers. In verse 37, he takes a dramatic shift uh, to 38. The previous 37 verses were a glorious summation of majesty, splendor, love, justice, faithfulness, and righteousness. But once again, what we love about the Psalms is that the Psalms are an accurate picture of real life. They're an accurate picture of real emotions and, <clears throat> and real thoughts. I mean, how many times have you had like the best week ever and then all of a sudden something happens and it's like the worst week ever? Or you had the worst week ever and then something happens and it's the best week ever. Isn't that how life goes? And so Ethan's mood is going to change. Look at verse 38 to 45. But now you have cast off and rejected you are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced your covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You have breached all his walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by him plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all of his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword. You have made him not stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease. You've cast his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth. You have covered him with shame. Verses 38 to 45 are essentially a reversal of verses 8, 19 to 27. Rather than being chosen, they are cast off and rejected. Rather than favor, they're experiencing wrath. Rather than faithfulness to a covenant, God has renounced his covenant. Rather than exaltation, his crown is thrown down in the dust. Rather than protection, he suffers a breach and destruction. Rather than having safety and security, he suffers scorn. Rather than rejoicing over his enemies, his enemies are rejoicing over him. Rather than victory in battle, he suffers defeat. Rather than wearing the title of a son, he wears a garment of shame. So what's going on? Is Ethan suffering from spiritual schizophrenia? Maybe he was, but I don't think so. Two points about these verses. Number one, obviously feelings and thoughts are not always reality and or truth. Ethan writes in these verses, you have renounced or in other words, you've repudiated, you've rejected, you've disavowed your covenant. Now he writes that right after writing, my covenant will stand firm. I will not violate my covenant. This is what God had said. God had not renounced his covenant, but that's how Ethan feels. Feelings and or thoughts are not always reality. And they're not always truth. This past week, I uh, had to buy a new coffee maker. We had the same coffee maker our whole marriage. Had it for 10 years. I was cleaning it with a brush. Cracked the carafe. I think that's how you say it. And uh, I had to buy a new one. It was cheaper just to buy a coffee maker than to buy the carafe because we got an expensive one for our wedding. Uh, and I, when I got the new one, it has this water filter on it. We didn't use a water filter before. It has this water filter, and the and, um, old one is 10 years old. And so, um, you know, and when I, when I make the coffee in the new coffee maker, I mean, it's no Tim Shepard coffee, but I was like, man, this tastes a whole lot better. This is really good. The old one was, probably had mildew in it. Sorry if you've been to our house and I made you coffee. Uh, <laughs> You know, probably it was like all mildewed inside those little pipings and stuff, you know, and, and uh, you know what? Like after, after drinking it a, a lot, if you have a coffee maker, your coffee maker's got mildew in it too, unless you clean it with vinegar, which who does that? Uh, um, my point is I, I just got used to it. You just get used to the taste. You can drink anything and just get used to it. 
you know, it's not until you use a filter that you begin to understand, wow, like, this is not what coffee's supposed to taste like. We need a filter. Sometimes you can feel something and think something so long that you become, you come to believe that it's true. You've just felt it and thought it, thought it so long that you've just convinced yourself it's true. We need a filter. Truth. We need a filter of truth. What is the truth? God had not renounced his covenant. He had not. Ethan feels that way, but God had not renounced it. Two, spiritual amnesia had set in. Even though God had not renounced his covenant, these things that were happening in these verses, they were really happening. These were true. These things were really happening. We're not told the context of this psalm, but most likely this is referring to the exile, or maybe it's post-exilic, looking back on the exile. But these things really did happen, aside from God renouncing his covenant. And it wasn't because God had renounced his covenant. It wasn't because God was faithless, or God was unkind, or God, you know, just enjoyed, like, <laughs> I'm going to just have some fun here. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. It was because of their sin. The exile and all of these things that happened was because of their sin. And here's the thing, spiritual amnesia had set in. In the middle of the magnificent and marvelous covenant that Ethan writes about just a few verses earlier, God told them, look at verse 30 to 32, if his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. It seems as though Ethan forgot that. And really Israel as a whole forgot this. They it wasn't because God was being unfaithful. It's because God was disciplining them for their sin. And maybe they hadn't forgotten. You know, if, if you want to go that route, I don't, I don't know. Maybe they just thought God's punishment was too severe. Maybe they thought it lasted too long. How difficult it is to believe that God knows better than us and how severe the discipline should be. How long the discipline should last. You know, often we think, okay, God, I've learned my lesson end the trial. I learned what you wanted me to, to learn. Now you can end the trial. And God continues. And that's the exact question that Ethan asks. Last section, 46 to 52. The, the exact question he asks is, how long, oh Lord? How long? Will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity you have created all the children of man. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old? Which by your faithfulness you swore to David. Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked. And how I bear in my heart the insults of the many nations with which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. You got to love that. <laughs> how long, O Lord? This is a common question that we ask. I was asking it this past week. I was asking God, God, how long? How long is this going to last? How long is this going to last? It's a question as old as the Bible. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O oh Lord, how long? How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long, O oh Lord, will you look on? How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Even the martyrs day after day in heaven right now are asking God, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long? 
before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Haman is worried that he will not live to see the steadfast love of the Lord again, that he will not live to see the faithfulness of God. That's why he's reminding God. He says, God, remember how short my time is. I might die at 50. I might die at 60, maybe 70 if I'm lucky. God, remember how short my time is. I want to see your steadfast love again. I want to see your faithfulness again. And he pleads with God, please remember and unlike Psalm 88, Ethan ends with a note of praise. Despite all the suffering, despite all the trials, despite all the harsh and prolonged discipline of God, Ethan is still wise enough to remember God is to be praised. Blessed be the Lord forever. And the congregation of God's people said, amen. and amen. I want to conclude, very short conclusion with one simple but profound point. And it's my only point this morning. Jesus secures steadfast love. Jesus guarantees steadfast love for his children. The coming of Jesus Christ as a baby is marvelous for infinite reasons. But one of the most central reasons that we celebrate Christmas and why we love Christmas is that we are recipients of a covenant, a covenant of steadfast love. Just as God said to David, David, I'm choosing you and I will never remove my love from you ever, ever. God comes to you and to me, to us who are in Christ. And he says to us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death depth or anything else and all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus secures, he guarantees steadfast love for his people. And he will never remove it.